Today we're going to talk about the replication of DNA virus genomes. And uh, in the next hour and a half, I'm going to tell you everything I know about it. And if I forget something, let me know. The object of this lesson is twofold. First of all, to explain what some of the similarities are between the way viruses replicate their genetic information and what some of the differences are. And that's important for really one reason, and that is when we think about how do you treat a virus infection, you have to be able to differentiate between what the virus does and what the host does and how the virus does what it does. So with that in mind, we'll uh, begin this discourse by just reviewing some of the structures that DNA viruses, in terms of their genomes, assume. And some of the simplest structures are those of a virus family called the parvovirus. And you recall from what Dr. Racaniello told you, these are single-strand genomes, and they exist in both plus and minus strand configurations. But each of them have this same very interesting structure where the ends contain terminal repeats, and that allows them to fold upon themselves and actually provides a point of entry for DNA polymerase. Other more complicated viruses that we will discuss include the polyomavirus family, a series of double-stranded circular molecules that are covalently closed circles. Those of you who have studied topology at all know that when you put two circles together and you wrap them around one another, you get something called a supercoil, which is a very complicated form where the two pieces of DNA, the two strands, wind around each other and form a knot, just as when you take a rubber band and you twist the end and it knots on itself. That creates some real constraints in terms of both replicating the molecules and separating them following replication. We'll discuss herpes virus replication in its broadest terms, and these are large linear duplex DNA molecules that contain up to three different origins of replication. So they can start in different points. And it's pertinent because these viruses undergo two forms of, uh, uh, they exist in two states in reality, the lytic infection state where the virus is replicating, causing things that you can think of as cold sores, and the lytic state where they lay in a quiescent uh, state in your neurons, in uh, certain blood cells, and it depends upon which of the viruses we're talking about. But under those conditions, that virus exists as a cir single circular molecule or multiple circular molecules that reside within um, a cell. And it could be your neurons, it could be your B cells, and it depends upon what it is. And we'll also talk about the adenovirus, which is another smaller linear DNA molecule that has very interesting properties because it has proteins that bind to the five prime end of uh, each of the two strands. So what is it that's so interesting about DNA replication of viruses? First of all, of course, it's a great way to study how DNA replication occurs at all, and it's always been the example. That is, one studies the virus because the virus is relatively simple. And despite the fact that we know many of the steps and the enzymes that are involved and the host proteins that are involved and the sites where replication occurs, we know very little about how the host actually replicates its DNA, but quite a bit about how viruses do. In almost every instance, and I can't think of an exception, replication of a virus uh, DNA molecule requires expression of at least one virus protein. And depending upon the virus family, um, there can be many, or there can be a single protein that's involved in activating the host so that the virus, which is a parasite, can co-opt the host's protein synthetic apparatus to its own use and make proteins and uh, replicate its DNA. DNA is always synthesized five prime to three prime and via a semi-conservative mode of replication, something I hope you learned in biology. Um, we don't know of an exception to that, but like everything else, it, that could change. Replication initiates at a defined origin, and that's an important point because it's all about getting started. It's where do these molecules provide an entry point for um, origin binding proteins, polymerases, various structures that allow these molecules to exist within inside the cell. And finally, 
in every case that we're going to talk about today, the host provides other proteins. There seems to be an exception, and that's the pox viruses, which seem to make most of their own uh, DNA synthetic proteins. Uh, and that could be because the virus replicates uh, in the cytoplasm of the infected cell. And yet it does require a nuclear stage. And so we don't know all of the mysteries behind that. So if what I said is true, what's the host good for? Well, as I said, viruses are parasites. As such, they exploit the host. They use um, scaffolds and enzymes that the host provides within the nucleus. They take over sites where chromosomes replicate and origins of chromosomal DNA uh, synthesis are present. Simple viruses conserve genetic information. A small virus that has a limited coding capacity doesn't have room to make a polymerase and the other products that it might need, such as a coat protein. So they're always busy hijacking more host proteins. Complex viruses, though, and they can be um, in size up to about 250 kilobases, encode many, but not all proteins required for replication. I showed you in the very first slide that these genomes come in a wide assortment of shapes and sizes, and those shapes and sizes are what governs how virus DNA replication initiates. Everything that I say is going to come back to initiation because that's really the event that governs when and where and how things happen. What's the outcome of replication? Well, it's progeny, and this is what the virus wants to do. It wants to make more of itself. Ideally, it would do it if without killing the host cell, but in many cases, uh, it's not left with much of an alternative because it's used all of the energy uh, synthesis machinery of the host. It's used all of the nucleotides that are available um, to make new nucleic acids for the host, and it sort of leaves the host with nothing inside of it. Yes? So let's, let's pursue that for just a second. The question is, are there other ways in which the virus kills the host? And the answer is yes. They so damage the structures within the host that there's nothing left. And you can think of it eating the cell from the inside out in the course of um, replicating and making many, many, many particles. They can actually burst the cell. Yes? Are there any examples of viruses that don't kill the host cell? Are there viruses that don't kill the host cell? The retroviruses do not, well, some of them. Some of them do a really good job of killing the host. Um, amongst the population of DNA viruses, there is nothing that ultimately does not kill the host. So there are, there are viruses that have uh, the ability to integrate within the host, the parvoviruses, the adeno-associated viruses, and they're of interest because they're now one of the prime vehicles for um, gene transfer and they're one of the more successful ones, although nobody ever thought that would work. But that's how we change our minds as we go along. Um, virus replication yields progeny, but what it also does is it acts as a switch for gene regulation. And in every instance that we know about, the onset of virus DNA replication does not occur immediately upon infection, but it requires some sort of virus-initiated event. And once DNA replication begins, then usually uh, at least one set and possible two, possibly two sets of virus genes are activated. And I don't mean two genes, I mean whole family of genes. So that's an important regulatory event in the transcriptional control and the cascade of virus gene regulation. And as I said, it's always delayed until after infection. The outcomes of virus DNA replication, lytic infection. New progeny, new virus, new places to go. The other thing is that there are now high copy numbers. Replication can result in anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 copies of virus DNA and a somewhat reasonable, uh, reasonably similar number of virus particles. There is an efficiency problem. Not all virus DNA is packaged. 
And as Dr. Racaniello has showed you, there are many empty particles as well. In other cases, we see latent infection. And in those cases, there's a stable assimilation in the host at a low copy number. So for those of you who have had herpes virus infections, that's 85% of you, um, you now have stable copies of this virus genome in your neural ganglia. And they're going to sit there. And for the most part, they're relatively benign. And every once in a while, they come back to visit. You have a test. You get a cold sore. You go out in the sun. And for some reason, something's aggravating you. You get a cold sore. And we don't really understand what the relationship is between stress and reactivation, but it's certainly real. And yet there are other herpes viruses, such as varicella zoster, thank you, which is the causative agent of chickenpox, which goes and causes chickenpox. None of you have probably had chickenpox, because most of you were vaccinated, or maybe not. But years later, this virus will recur, and it causes shingles. And shingles is a wonderful source for spreading chickenpox, because what you have is active uh, infected tissue, which is full of virus particles, which is readily aerosolized. And when we talk about varicella, you'll see how it's, um, it goes down the airways. So that's the second coming of varicella. Now, these virus genomes that are latently uh, associated with the host can be episomal, just like plasmids are in bacteria. That is, they exist outside of the chromosome. And in cells that don't replicate, you don't see replication of these viral DNA molecules. However, if you're in a cell that does replicate, for example, a B cell, an antibody-producing cell, and you're infected with Epstein-Barr virus, this chromosome is present as a circle, and its replication is coordinately controlled with the host. And that's a very interesting story, because the virus proteins that are normally involved in replicating this molecule are not present. The virus itself is actually relatively quiet, and only a few virus proteins are made. OK, what do you need for DNA replication? Um, you need a place to start. And that's generally characterized in double-stranded DNA viruses by an AT-rich DNA sequence. Sometimes it's a palindrome. It reads the same backwards and forwards. And those structures are capable of forming stem loops. They almost always need a protein that recognizes this sequence, an origin-binding protein. So there are many ways of priming DNA synthesis, that is, beginning the actual replication. Traditionally, DNA synthesis uses an RNA primer through Okazaki fragments. And we'll talk about that in boring detail. In the case of the parvovirus, or the pox virus, they use hairpin structures that fold back on themselves. Those in and of themselves create a real problem for duplicating the ends of molecules, and I'm not going to overwhelm you with that information. If you are interested, though, there's a very um, cogent series of diagrams in your text which will explain it, and no, you don't have to know it. And finally, we recognize that there are proteins that are used as primers. And they're not primers per se. And when I show you how adenovirus replicates its DNA, you'll see what I mean. But what they do is they covalently attach to the five prime end of the genome. And they form a site that allows for um, addition of a single nucleotide. And that single nucleotide has a free three prime hydroxyl. And that's always the source for chain extension. So we have a recognition site. We have a site for priming, and then we have elongation. Elongation occurs through uh, two mechanisms, leading strand synthesis and lagging strand synthesis. And what you'll see as we discuss this in a little more detail later is that they both go in the same direction when DNA replication is bidirectional. And finally, you have termination. And termination is sometimes as simple as falling off the end of the molecule. So in a linear molecule, it's just like Columbus. He went to the end, and he fell off. Um, in circular molecules, it's much more difficult. So viruses don't replicate well in quiescent cells. Why is that? 
because they need the products that the host uses to make its own DNA. They want to subjugate the host for their own purposes. So to address that problem, what they do is they induce host replication enzymes and cell cycle regulators. Cell cycle regulators are predominantly used to uh, push cells into DNA replication so that they can divide. In the case of a virus-infected cell, they're unlikely to divide for the most part unless the virus transforms the cell and remains stably associated with it. And what you need to know is that the viruses encode proteins that are either termed immediate early, made just after infection, or early if there is no immediate early stage, and that these proteins are invariably used to either initiate or to replicate virus genomes. Yes? Um, the link, so the question is, is it the link between virus and cancer? Is turning on the cell process the link between virus and cancer? In reality, it's turning off the cell processes that are involved in regulation of cell division. So when you have a uh, cell division that's controlled, cells stop dividing when they touch one another. When you can disrupt regulation, then the cells crawl over one another and uh, form uh, tumors and, and they can metastasize, spread to other sites. Um, where does the polymerase come from? As I told you before, small DNA viruses tend to be very economical in their use of genetic information and they do not code an entire replication system, frequently only providing a single protein, which is more often than not multifunctional. So it's one protein that can do a lot of things. And those proteins can orchestrate the host. Members of those families are the papillomaviridae, the polyomaviridae, and the parvoviridae, all small genomes of about five to eight kilobases in size. Large DNA viruses encode most of their own replication systems. So that's um, an element of distinction between the two. What are some of these virus-encoded proteins? To start, you need an origin-binding protein in almost every situation. You either have an origin binding protein or you have something that substitutes for it or provides it. The viruses frequently encode helicases, proteins that are involved in unwinding DNA. And that's very important when you consider the various structures that we'll be look at, looking at. And a primase that's involved in initiating um, the early events along with something like polymerase alpha. So primase plus polymerase alpha gives you that small RNA chain that's used to initiate DNA synthesis. DNA polymerase. Many of the viruses that we'll talk about today encode their own DNA polymerases and accessory proteins. And these accessory proteins do several things. Some of them are there just as chaperones. So you can think of them as Sharon's. They're there to help you cross the river Styx, if you will. They take you to hell. And that's exactly what's going to happen here because the virus is going to replicate. But these proteins don't have a way of getting into the nucleus so these accessory proteins bring them there. Sometimes they stick on the virus DNA and interact with a host protein and affords a docking site for the polymerase, which otherwise can't find where it needs to be. There are exonucleases, which are important in both editing, in case the virus DNA makes a mistake, and DNA polymerases are much more faithful uh, than the RNA polymerases that Dr. Racaniello has been talking about, and they don't make too many mistakes, but occasionally they do, and the exos help to do that. They also help to solve a problem of lagging strand synthesis, and we'll get to that. And finally, some of these viruses encode enzymes that are important in providing nucleoside triphosphates. You infect a neuron, and what's going on? Nothing. Well, sometimes they're thinking or sending electric signals, but they're not replicating. They don't have large pools of deoxynucleotide triphosphates because neurons don't divide, so there's no reason to have them. So when a virus provides an enzyme such as thymidine kinase, which can bring in thymidine, a DNA precursor from outside, a ribonucleotide reductase, which is involved in synthesizing deoxyribonucleotides, or a DUTPase, which um, re removes... Um, 
the ribose moiety and substitutes a deoxy moiety, you now have provisions for making DNA. You have now supplemented the nucleotide triphosphate pool. All right, so where does it occur? DNA replicates in replication centers. Seems obvious when you say it, but the templates in the proteins form at sites within the cell that were previously occupied by chromosome replication sites. So here's a little experiment. Now let's just go a little further. These discrete sites are called ND10s for nuclear domain 10 or PML body bodies. That stands for promyelocytic leukemia bodies, identified because it was a protein that was present in myelocytic leukemia. In these sites are polymerases, ligases, helicases, and topoisomerases. Topoisomerases are things that unravel, supercoils, separate molecules, and help to resolve DNA structures. So if we look at DNA painted in green, a virus protein painted in red, and merge the two images, then we see pre-infection. There are all these DNA molecules all over this nucleus, and we see no viral protein because it's not infected. Post-infection, we see that the DNA and the virus protein are in the same site. So this is a merged image where the red and the green have been overlaid, and you can see that they form yellow. So they're occupying the same site, and these are sites that are important for the host, not just for DNA replication, but they're also used for transcription. More on that next week, after your exam. Okay, so getting started. As I've said to you, the origins of DNA replication tend to be AT-rich segments, and that's because AT is an easier base pair to melt than GC. So that's an accessibility issue. Once these segments are recognized by the origin recognition, recognition proteins, they seed assembly of multi-protein complexes. Now, these are very variable in nature, but some things are common to all of them. While they will have DNA binding proteins, they will have the alpha polymerase primase mechanism of the host or the virus, depending upon what it is. They will have helicases and they will uh, eventually bring in some other cell proteins, depending on what the virus is, to initiate this replication. I told you before, some viruses have one origin, others have up to three, and they can be used for different purposes. It's well known that for both herpes simplex virus and Epstein-Barr viruses, two different members of the herpes virus family, that their origins of DNA synthesis are used for latent infection, and a different set of origins are used in lytic infection. So they have some way of um, differentiating between them. The other thing that's pertinent, to, pertinent is that they're often associated with transcriptional control regions. And this goes back to what I said to you before, and that is that DNA, the initiation of DNA replication can frequently represent a switch in the regulatory control of virus replication. So different genes get turned on, other genes get turned off, all because DNA synthesis is initiated. So here we are, we're back to our genomes. And let's take another look because we're going to, um, in some detail, cover all of these. I, whoops. So here's your parvovirus with its terminal repeats. And in the terminal repeat is another area called the inverted repeat. This provides a um, three prime hydroxy, which allows for synthesis, and it comes around and does some amazing things, which I don't want you to know. Um, this is herpes simplex virus. It has two identical origins called ORES, and they're called that because the virus genome is basically broken up into two segments a short unique region and a long unique region. And these two guys are contained within sequences that are identical. Ergo, they're the same. And there's a distinct one present in the long unique region. Again, here's our adenovirus molecule, whose five prime ends are covered by terminal protein, an adenovirus specified protein. And here's uh, the simple schematic diagram 
of a polyomavirus um, DNA molecule with its origin, but in reality it looks like this. And this is that supercoiled molecule, knotted about itself. And if you have any questions about this, again, just take a rubber band and twist it, and you'll see what happens to it. When you nick that molecule, introduce a single break in, a single of, in one of the two strands of DNA, the molecule relaxes, and now you have a circle. And that's a simple topological problem. But it's one that has to be addressed. OK, so again, here's your circle. When you wind it up, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter until you finally get to the point with that rubber band where it collapses on itself. And that's what a supercoiled molecule really looks like. It's actually a ball. It has a very um, uh, specific shape, and that's resolved um, in many different ways using gels or gradients and things that will differentiate between um, this structure and this structure. And that's only important because what we know is that when the virus replicates it di its DNA, it does it from this structure. And it's very hard to figure out how it um, gets through all those knots and tangles. And um, that's an interesting problem. Okay, so what do the origins look like? Um, you'll notice some similarity between these first two molecules. SV40, a small, circular, supercoiled DNA molecule, and herpes simplex virus. And here's just one of its origins of replication. It has these palindromic sites that are AT rich, shares those with SV40. It has another set of origins that are in that unique short region. And in both cases, these origins of DNA replication are either part of or between genes. In this case, a gene called UL30 and UL29. And oddly enough, those two genes are very important for virus DNA replication. We'll get back to that later. In the case of SV40, this origin of replication differentiates between what's known as the early region, which encodes a protein family called the T antigens, originally because they were transformation antigens seen on the surface, or portions of them seen on the surface of uh, virus transformed cells. But more importantly, it's a very large protein that's absolutely essential for DNA replication and the switch from early to late synthesis and then a region that encodes the late proteins, which are all code proteins. In the case of adenovirus, we have this terminal protein at the 5' end, which acts as a guide at first, and you'll see what I mean by that, because this is on the 5' uh, end, and only one of the two strands gets replicated at a time, but they both do get replicated, and that's how adeno achieves semi-conservative replication. What are some of these origin replication proteins? The polyomavirus family encodes T antigens, very large, very complicated molecules, with many sites for interaction with host proteins. And those sites govern initiation of virus DNA replication. And they're also the sites that control the host cell cycle. And that's how they perturb um, cell division and, and reg regulation. Papillomaviruses, which are the causative agent of cervical carcinoma and also laryngeal carcinoma and anal ca cancers, um, have a protein called E1, which in and of itself is not a DNA binding protein. But it also elaborates another early protein called E2, which recognizes sites at the origin of DNA replication and brings E1 to it. So one can think of E2 as both an origin binding protein and an accessory protein, something that's mediating the exchange of information between the virus and the cell to initiate uh, DNA replication. Adeno-associated virus has a protein called Rep6878, and it binds at those ends, those free, no, not those free ends, but those ends that form the, uh, the panhandle in the parvovirus. And it unwinds that DNA so that it's accessible for DNA replication. That same protein plays a role in terminal resolution. Again, if you're interested, please go to the book and look at that. Adenovirus preterminal protein binds at the terminus and recruits DNA polymerase, and in doing so allows for initiation of virus DNA replication. 
and herpes simplex virus encodes a protein known as UL9, which is an origin binding protein, and that again recruits viral proteins to the AT rich origins, unwinds DNA, and initiates, helps to initiate virus DNA replication. Here are your structures. We'll go through these a lot of times because I sort of want to pound them into your head. Um, but these are what the double stranded molecules look like the circular molecules, the linear molecules that have proteins at the end. We're not going to discuss pox viruses, they have a terminal loop, they're actually just a big circle. But they use inverted, these inverted uh, terminal repeats as sites to initiate DNA synthesis and the herpes viridae. We also have the single stranded virus DNA, such as the parvoviridae. Again, remember that there's both a plus and a minus form for these, but one capsid only contains either a plus molecule or a minus molecule. The replication machinery actually doesn't care. It will replicate each of them to make double-stranded DNA. And then the circoviridae, which are circular single-stranded uh, virus molecules about which we know very, very little about how they replicate. Finally, and Dr. Racaniello has told you a bit about this, is the hepatitis B virus, or the hepatinovirus life cycle. And it starts with this unusual structure that contains a minus strand that is complete with a protein at its five prime end and a plus strand that has an RNA at its five end and a five prime cap and is incomplete. And when this molecule enters the cell, it uses the virus associated reverse transcriptase to complete replication of that circular molecule and somehow or other turn that into a covalently closed supercoiled molecule, which is a substrate for DNA replication. So there are two major uh, row, modes of DNA replication that we'll discuss today. One involves use of replication forks, where both strands are synthesized pretty much simultaneously. And the viruses that use that are listed here, the papillomavirus, the polyomavirus, herpes, retrovirus, provirus. That's when it's actually in um, the DNA of the host. And strand displacement using primers, such as how adenovirus does it, parvoviruses, or poxviruses. And in this case, one strand gets replicated at a time. The other strand, strand gets displaced, and that one is subsequent, subsequently replicated. So in order to replicate a polyomavirus and to establish these replication forks, you need to initiate. In this case, there's only a single origin. And before initiation can begin, the virus enters the cell. Its genome gets to the nucleus. It gets transcribed. And it makes this protein called T antigen. T antigen does everything. It's sort of the multifunctional protein. These molecules replicate as covalently closed circles. Again, a topological problem. It's a circle that's tightly knotted. How do you find things? How do you move things? How do you end things? Leading strand replication occurs via extension from an RNA primer. So you only need one RNA primer to extend that strand. Replication is bidirectional, so it goes in two directions at once from a single origin. So there are two leading strands and two lagging strands, and you'll see that in a moment. Lagging strand synthesis, however, is delayed until the replication fork has moved. So you have to open up regions of DNA in order to start lagging strand synthesis, and you'll see why. And one of the reasons for that is that replication on leading and lagging strands in a bidirectional mode is occurring in the same direction, even though you're filling out in what appears to be operate, opposite directions. And the reason for that is that DNA synthesis occurs in a five prime to three prime direction. And when you see it, you'll understand it. It also uses RNA primers, and the difference is that it creates discontinuities. So small pieces of DNA are replicated at a time on the lagging strand. And the major problem that results from that is how do you fill the gaps? How do you close those discontinuous um, pieces of DNA? 
Okay. In order to know a little bit about initiation, you need to know a little bit more about this protein called T antigen. It turns out there are many different members of the polyomavirus family. Um, there are several very interesting viruses that infect man, and we'll talk about those in a subsequent uh, lecture. But they all have the same property. They all have some variant of this T antigen, this very large um, DNA binding protein. T antigen is species specific. So if you take a virus from a monkey and you put that virus genome into a mouse, it won't replicate. And it won't replicate because that T antigen, which is of primate origin, does not recognize the mouse DNA polymerase. So it doesn't form pre-initiation complexes. So it's a failure to interact with this polymerase alpha primase, which is involved in forming the Okazaki fragments, the RNA that's responsible for initiating DNA replication. Yes? So H5N1 is flu. Oh, yes. Okay, so, and, and it's an RNA virus. Sorry. So it's okay. If you were trying to adapt So if you virus. wanted to adapt this virus, you would have to have it encode a T antigen from a murine virus. Okay, and that's been done. But then it wouldn't replicate back in primates. So it's okay. Um, I told you that this protein binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators. And what that does is it causes cells to enter the S phase. And it can do this asynchronously. Normally, you'll know that there's a very logical, well, the cell thinks it's a very logical order in terms of what their replication cycle is. And you go from G1 to S to G2. And once you disrupt that synchrony, you now make available to the virus the proteins that are ordinarily used to make more DNA. So that now makes it unnecessary for the virus to encode those proteins. T antigen synthesis is autoregulated. What does that mean? That means that once you make a certain amount of it, it goes back, it sits on the DNA, and you'll see how it sits on the day, DNA in a minute. And one of the things that it does is it occludes the promoter that's used to drive transcription of the messenger RNA that encodes this protein. So that's autoregulation. It turns itself off. The protein is heavily modified. It has many different kinds of decorations, acetylations, phosphorylations, um, ribosylation. And these things are important because they control DNA binding. It controls how the protein interacts with host proteins. It promotes cooperativity. You don't get just one T antigen molecule binding to an origin. You have two sets of molecules that are hexameric in nature. And ultimately, it affects whether or not the molecule will unwind DNA. So how it's changed by the host, all, all the modifications are host-driven, affects what the protein does. OK, so here's a schematic diagram of T antigen. And what's pertinent here is what it associates with. And most of these data were um, derived from studies by Carol Privis here in the Department of Biology. And you'll note that T antigen interacts with polymerase alpha, the protein that's required to make the RNA primers. It interacts with P53 and RB, two cell cycle regulators that are very important for controlling cell division. Once you knock these guys out, you now activate the enzymatic machinery for DNA replication. It has an origin of DNA binding uh, site. It interacts with proteins that are involved in folding, host uh, proteins such as HSC70 in the J domain. And it has an ATPase activity, which is important in its helicase activity. In order to generate the energy to unwind DNA, it has to consume ATP. And finally, it has single-stranded binding activity, and that's important in moving the replication forks through the replication apparatus.
OK. What does it see? It sees this sequence. And this is the core. And as I told you before, in the polyomavirus family, the origin is pretty much between the promoter for the early region and the late region. It contains binding sites for this T antigen and SP1 sites, which happen to be regulatory sites for RNA transcription. It's AT rich and it's nucleosome free. So it's the only portion of this DNA molecule that doesn't have host histones wrapped around it. And the reason for that is to provide accessibility for the DNA synthetic apparatus. All right, so here we are, we have our molecule, and here's a linear representation of that double strand with its origin of replication. And now it's going to replicate bidirectionally, okay? It's going to go from the center and it's going to spread out in both directions simultaneously. It's going to form a replication bubble, sometimes thought of as a theta form. And if you draw a theta, you'll see that in the top is that replication bubble. We have two leading strands, and they're replicating 5 prime to 3 prime, 5 prime to 3 prime, and then the lagging strands. The lagging strands can't replicate from here because there's no 5 prime. The 5 prime is here at the replication fork. So lagging strands and leading strands both replicate in the same direction. One does it discontinuously, one does it continuously. It's a function of availability of five prime ends. So, as I said, leading strand synthesis is continuous. Lagging strand synthesis is discontinuous. And the direction of synthesis off of either template strand is the same. Always going in the same direction. Just remember, it's five prime to three prime. It's like it's the way you make RNA, it's the way you make DNA, and it's the way you get an A in this course. Okay, so now we want to initiate DNA synthesis on this molecule. And here we have our large T binding site, but it's actually two sites. And in the presence of ATP and large T, these monomers form hexamers. And what they are is actually, think of it as your hands grabbing around a rope. They're like two clamps around the double-stranded DNA molecule, and they circumscribe that origin of replication. And in doing so, in the presence of ATP, there's a conformational change to the DNA structure. And what happens is it begins to open up. It opens up from the helicase activity of the T antigen. So it's now unwinding the palindrome, making that DNA accessible as a site for initiation. Along comes a host protein, replication protein A, that coats the DNA and now what you have is single strands that are separated. The helicase opens them, Rep A binds to it, and allows these two pieces of DNA to separate. So they're now in a configuration which makes them accessible for initiating DNA synthesis. So this summarizes what I've just said up to this point. Binding, distortion of the DNA helix. Remember that you've got this crazy ass supercoil. Um, you bring in RPA and topoisomerases, which help to unwind the DNA. You have helicases, you have topos that are nicking DNA, opening it up, relaxing it, and allowing it to become single-stranded and bind RPA. Okay, so how do we know that there's a unique site for DNA replication? And this is a very simple, very straightforward um, experiment that illustrates why a picture is worth a thousand words. You have a circular molecule. You can linearize a circular molecule if there is a unique restriction endonuclease site in that DNA. So if you take a circle and you cut it once, then you have a linear molecule. If there is a unique site for initiation of DNA synthesis, then as the replication bubble grows, the distance from here to here and here to here should remain constant. That is, if it's bidirectional replication, that bubble will grow and it will uh, be the same size to the left and to the right of it. So let's take a look. Here's that linearized molecule. 
here's a molecule very early on in replication, and you see that it initiates asymmetrically because this site happens to be uh, not 180 degrees from here. And as that replication bubble grows, it grows in two directions, here and here. It gets larger here and here, until finally you realize that what's left at this end is very small, but there's quite a bit left here. And this is a very simple demonstration of bidirectional replication. And there were lots of people who did really, really complicated experiments, but looking was easier. And it's, I think it's a much easier way to understand it than some of the other ways that have been uh, used. Okay, so here's the problem. We're back to DNA replication. We have two replication forks, right? We've started from a single origin. That origin is now duplicated because DNA replication has occurred. We are making DNA, okay? And we make DNA five prime to three prime, five prime to three prime. Leading strand easy, single RNA primer. Lagging strand more difficult because you have to start when the replication fork opens. So if you start here and you make DNA and you synthesize back, obviously you have to start again up here. And the problem that you're left with is this problem. Getting rid of the RNA, which now leaves a gap, filling that in, and bringing these two molecules together. So you have to ligate. You have to remove the RNA primers from the discontinuous lagging strand and ligate those small pieces of DNA together. So <clears throat> let's go through replication in a little more detail. Formation of a presynthesis complex is fairly easy. We have the T antigen that comes down. It opens up the DNA. It allows entry of RPA and polymerase alpha. Polymerase alpha is the molecule that forms the RNA um, initiator. And then replication factor C binds the three prime hydroxy along of uh, uh, the RNA primer along with a molecule called proliferating cell nuclear antigen and polymerase delta. And it's polymerase delta that actually does the DNA synthesis. It's what extends the primer. So you need two different host polymerases. <coughs> RFC is a clamp loading, loading protein, and it's something that keeps the structure in place. And that's important because if you think about what the molecule is that's replicating, it's this knotted, supercoiled thingy. And how does it get through? Does it move or does the structure move? Well, it turns out that you have these replication forks where the T antigen sits and helps uh, to start this replication process. And then you have two multiprotein complexes that have these clamps. And they allow the DNA through. And we'll see a movie of that, which will help you visualize that. RFC allows entry of PCNA onto DNA. And that causes release of pole alpha and entry of pole delta. And you get continuous copying of the parental strand. So it's just like a locomotive going down the track. There's nothing stopping it. The lagging strand is not so easy. Again, first you have your primer and your Okazaki fragment, and they're made by the Paul Alpha primase complex. DNA is copied from the replication fork towards the origin. You have multiple initiations because you can't make it continuously. Both strands move in the same direction, and it's the template that moves. The template has to move, otherwise those molecules would never untangle themselves. Here's a picture of what DNA looks like when large T is bound to it and has begun to unwind it. And we see the DNA because a protein called single-strand binding protein is now bound to it. So you have these two regions that extend, that, rep that represent the two replication forks. And the double-stranded DNA doesn't stain with this molecule because the single-stranded DNA binding protein can't bind to it. Yes? It depends on the virus. So in this case, um, we're looking at something coming from the host, um, and in other cases, it'll be the virus. There are a bunch of cellular proteins that are important for this, and we've uh, described them to some extent for now. Uh, I will go into them in a little bit more detail as we go through replication. Uh, 
And the ones that we haven't talked about are RNase H, which removes, it's an endonuclease that removes the RNA primer. FEN1, which is an exonuclease, which helps to remove these guys. And DNA ligase that seals the DNA fragments. So here we are. We're back at the start. We have our initiating complex. We've opened up the DNA. It's bound by RPA, polymerase alpha primase comes in, in the presence of deoxynucleotide triphosphates and ATP, it begins synthesis of the leading strand. RFC and PCNA come in, and in the presence of ATP, they help to form these complexes on the lagging strand. So here's your replication factor C, here's PCNA which brings it in, here's the guy that's responsible for making the RNA primer, and you can see just visually these are two different structures on the leading strand and the lagging strand. And that's because while they're doing the same thing, making DNA, they're doing it differently. Okay, finally we get to the point where both strands are extending, and the leading strands are doing it very smoothly, and the lagging strands still have the RPA bound to them because they need to have that to separate out the single strands. And they have all of these molecules going on simultaneously. They have poly A making... RNA primers and that primase, and then they have these other guys, PCNA and RFC, coming in behind them, and then Paul Delta comes on, they make a little bit of DNA. But the DNA ends because it runs into the molecule that was synthesized before it. Finally, it gets to the point where you have to connect these pieces, these short segments of DNA. And you do that by removing the RNA, filling the gaps, and sealing. Filling the gaps is done with Paul Delta. Removing the RNA is done with RNase H and FEN1, which is a nuclease, and DNA ligase seals the gaps. So all of that is summarized in this very, very complicated slide, but if you throw this out and go back and you follow the steps before, you'll see that it all makes sense. It's all about getting started, going in two directions, differentiating between leading strands and lagging strands, and remembering that in the end, you have to make a circular DNA molecule. The only way you can do that is by closing up the various pieces. So if you look at the DNA machine, which is this, showing you one of the large T antigen <coughs> hexamers, what you have is the leading strand coming out, very happily making new DNA, and the lagging strand having to bubble out its single strand in order for the primase to make it, to, be, uh, to have the DNA accessible to it so that it can uh, prime DNA synthesis, lead back, and eventually make a double-stranded RNA, a uh, DNA molecule. Now, it started for me. So this is, so this is a diagram, a, di a schematic of how DNA is replicated. And what you can see is that it's the DNA that's moving. We have this wonderful little machine that's making leading strand, looping out the lagging strand time after time, and you can see that this guy remains static. It's the same proteins doing it, whereas the lagging strand is constantly exchanging components because it's making little pieces, getting rid of the RNA, making a little bit more filling in the gaps, and ligating it to close. The eventual result of this is two continuous uh, double-stranded molecules. Okay, so that's how simple DNA replication is. The problems <coughs> are diagrammed here. The first is you have this covalently closed circular template, which doesn't really look like this. It looks more like this. So every time you unwind a bit to make it accessible for DNA replication, you tighten up the back end of the molecule. And that results in overwinding. The way it's dealt with is with topoisomerases, and you saw that they were part of the replication complex. Every time uh, there's a need to, as the winding becomes tighter and tighter, they sense that, they make a nick, they relieve it. So it's like going home and having a glass of wine. 
you unwind, you relax, you go on to the next thing. In the end, though, you go from here to here. So you have one mess to a bigger mess. And the way that's resolved is with an enzyme called topoisomerase 2, which cleaves both strands, holds them in place, releases them so that they actually unwind, and allows the two circles to come apart. When they're tied up like this, they're called catenated molecules. Okay, you've started, you've elongated, and you have a question. The two double stranded circles are linked. The two double stranded circles are linked. The topo cuts and seals, right? Okay. Okay, so termination or the end. You have to separate the molecules from the replication complex. As I said to you, the topos relax and unwind, and that relieves torsional stress. Unwinding leads to overwinding throughout the rest of the molecule. And that's why topo 2 is there, to separate the daughter molecules. Now, one of the things that you should know is that termination on a circular event is not specific. It occurs 180 degrees from where it started. You could replace those sequences with, you know, fly DNA, and it wouldn't know the difference. What happens is the two polymerases collide, and that seems to be the signal for termination. It knows it's the end. And as I said before, on a linear molecule, you just fall off. That's real easy. Um, I just wanted to mention this for a moment. Again, um, you should understand the fact that things like parvoviruses have these beautifully uh, redundant terminal repeats that allow them to provide their own three prime hydroxy. So it's a site for nucleation and for adding uh, DNA. It's a three prime hydroxy. You can add a five prime triphosphate. You can extend that molecule. It creates some vicious problems in replicating the end of the molecule, but again, we won't deal with that. Um, what you should know is that this is a virus that is called a dependovirus. It depends on the host for almost everything. It does not use polymerase alpha because it does not use Okazaki fragments in making DNA. Instead, it uses that inverter terminal repeat to self-prime. You can think of it as uh, molecular masturbation if you must. It requires polymerase delta, RFC, and PCNA. Same components that SV40, the polyomaviruses do. In fact, those are the same components that most viruses need. They need these products to faithfully make DNA. It has its own proteins that are important for initiation and resolution. And this provides endonuclease, helicase activity, and it binds the five prime terminus. And recognize one thing. You're making a single strand of DNA. There's no replication fork. That requires two strands. OK, now let's move on to adenovirus genomes. And they replicate by strand displacement synthesis. So they replicate one strand at a time, even though they're a double-stranded DNA molecule. They utilize a protein primer, and that's a bit of a misnomer, and I'll show you why. They have origins at both ends of the molecule, so each strand has a five prime end and a three prime end, and those three prime ends serve as the template for the initiation of synthesis, but it's the protein primer on the five prime end that serves as a guide. Again, I'm going to show you that. Assembly of preterminal protein into a pre-initiation complex activates covalent linkage of a deoxycytidine monophosphate to a serine residue in this protein using viral DNA polymerase. Long sentence. What does it mean? It means that there's a protein at the end of the molecule, serves as a guide. It needs to be made after virus infection. So the protein that's present on the incoming virus is merely a guide and is not used to initiate DNA replication. And you need to make a viral DNA polymerase. So you need early transcription, and that early transcription encodes both this preterminal protein and the viral DNA polymerase. DNA replication is semi-conservative from different replication forks. So. 
How does the protein primates priming work? There is a protein, PTP, precursor to terminal protein. It gets cleaved and then becomes uh, terminal protein. The adenovirus DNA polymerase links the alpha phosphoryl group of deoxycytidine monophosphate to a hydroxy of a serine residue in PTP. Now you have this, this DCMP, stuck to the serine residue with a free 3' prime hydroxy. This is only added when the protein primer is assembled with DNA polymerase into a pre-initiation complex. So like every other DNA molecule that we study and uh, we look at its replication, it requires some sort of pre-initiation complex. In this case, it's virus DNA polymerase, virus DNA, pre-TP. And here's how it goes. Here's your incoming DNA molecule. It has protein at its 5' end. It transcribes that DNA. When it transcribes that DNA, it makes a bunch of proteins. One of them is PTP. One of them is DBP, DNA binding protein. It's a single strand DNA binding protein. And the third protein is DNA polymerase. Polymerase associates with PTP, identifies the three prime end of that molecule, and invades it. And once it has done this um, invasion, it now adds this deoxycytidine moiety. Now you have the free three prime hydroxyl, which is important uh, for making DNA. So that's the initiation site. As DNA synthesis progresses, the DNA binding protein binds to the other strand, which is now single stranded. So it's being displaced. It's pushing it out of the way. Eventually, this molecule um, goes the entire length of the viral genome, and you get a faithful copy. The other molecule, think of them as Watson and Crick, peels off and forms this bizarre little pan handle. And this little pan handle now has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. And it forms this panhandle because there are inverted terminal repeats that allow these DNAs to form a duplex. And then the same reaction occurs. Again, PTP enters. It enters with polymerase. It now polymerizes down faithfully through this single-stranded um, entity, but it doesn't have to displace a strand. As a result of that, you get two faithful copies of the original DNA virus genome made off of each strand independently. So it's semi-conservative replication, but from two unique um, reactions. Um, and we'll close with herpes simplex virus. And um, I'm fond of saying there's nothing simple about simplex. And it's a very complicated molecule. It's a very complicated replication cycle. But I just want to point out a few things to you. Um, the virus DNA exists in four configurations. And what happens is that there is a junction here between the inverted repeat on the long molecule. So there's a terminal repeat long, inverted repeat long, an inverted repeat short, a terminal repeat short. And there's a molecular swivel here that we know nothing about. But what we do know is it allows for four different isomers of the same DNA. And those isomers, somehow or other, are present in the same molarity. So they're equimolar. An interesting problem. And if you think about the structure, you realize that genetically these molecules are identical if there are no genes that go across the junctions. The only time a gene would be interrupted is if it went across the junction. So think about that. It's amusing. Um, DNA enters the cell as a linear molecule. And then with the aid of cellular enzymes, it converts into a circle. So this linear molecule is converted into a circle. It does this somewhere on the way into the nucleus. And then the virus dissociates the ND10 structures of the host, the nuclear domain 10s. They absolutely disappear within an hour of infection. And then they reappear. Maybe not quite the same, but there are actual structures that are present in the cell, about 10 of them, and that's why they're called 
nuclear domain tens, and they contain virus DNA. And the virus DNA replicates as a rolling circle. So let's look at this in a bit of detail. This linear molecule comes in. It gets circularized using only host proteins, DNA ligase 4, and a recombination protein called XRCC4. And so they're responsible for that. How do we know that? If you infect a cell in the presence of a protein synthesis inhibitor so that no new proteins can be made, the circles accumulate. So we know that that's a step that doesn't require de novo protein synthesis. What it doesn't do is it doesn't rule out the fact that there may be something associated with the incoming virion that's responsible for that. But that's yet to be shown. Okay. The virus genome encodes a variety of products, seven, that are required for DNA replication. Three of them, UL5, 8, and 52, form a primase complex, just like everybody we've talked about, something that's required for initiation of DNA synthesis. UL42 is a processivity protein required to move the polymerase along down the molecule. UL9 is our origin binding protein. So it's the protein that identifies the place to start. UL29 is a single-stranded DNA binding protein. Helps to separate the molecules. Remember, we're in a circle now. And we've seen how circles mole uh, circular molecules replicate, almost. And UL30 is a DNA polymerase. All of those things are necessary, but not sufficient. You can isolate these proteins, put them into a test tube, throw in a molecule that has an origin of DNA replication, and not get faithful DNA replication. So there's something that the cell provides that we don't understand. It can be a place, it can be a protein, it could be a place and a protein, but all those things are necessary to get this thing to replicate. So what happens? Here's our replicating molecule. Think of it just like you thought of the polyomavirus. We have the origin binding protein. It happens to dimerize. When it interacts with viral DNA, it pushes out these DNA molecules. It allows entry of a single-stranded DNA binding protein to separate the two strands. And then our helicase and primase comes in to open up the DNA and unwind it and allow the primase, uh, excuse me, and allow the polymerase and processivity protein in to replicate DNA. So it's really very much the same as the SV40 molecule, except instead of using host proteins, it's bringing along its own. That provides a very interesting target for antiviral therapy. And in fact, most of the antivirals that are used target either uh, some of these molecules or the viral thymidine kinase. So these are things that are distinct from the host and allow you to differentiate. Okay, now, you've got this circular molecule, and it turns out that during the course of replication, you probably replicate the circle, but at some point it opens up and provides a free five prime ended strand that allows for discontinuous DNA synthesis. And what results from this are what are called concatamers, not concatenates, but concatamers, head to tail copies of virus DNA of almost infinite length, very, very long. And these get clipped at very specific sites called packaging sites, cleavage packaging sites, that um, are formed by viral capsid proteins. So it's the capsid proteins that cut the DNA, and that facilitates incorporation of the DNA into the capsid. So let's end on this note with the thought that virus DNA replication requires initiation. It can use viral or host proteins, or both requires a discrete site, and that site can be composed of nucleic acid. It can be composed of RNA copies of DNA. It can be a protein molecule that has something on its end. Um, and finally, all DNA replication that we know about goes in the five prime to three prime direction. You have to know the difference between leading and lagging strands and what differentiates these things. And with that, you should be fine on Monday. Thank you.